welcome to the Bigfoot Society. In this episode, listener John shares publicly for the first time in 40 years about his Bigfoot experience that he had in the Sabine River area of Deep East Texas. If you've experienced something similar to what John has or have more information regarding Bigfoot or other cryptids in the same areas, please reach out immediately to me after this episode. Remember, your encounter could be the key to unlocking this mystery once and for all, so please don't hesitate to contact me at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. All right, Bigfoot Society, I've got the privilege of talking to John. He's a listener from down in Texas. He's had some interesting things happen that he did want to share. So, John, hope everything's going well. I'm going to go ahead and hand it on over to you, sir. Yes, sir, Jeremiah. So it's good talking to you this evening. I've read some of your podcasts and listened to them. So I wanted to share my story of something that I've never experienced before, of course. So basically, I grew up in, in northeast Texas. A little town called Henderson is where we first lived when I was six, seven years old, I guess. And it was we lived way on the country. Our closest neighbor was probably three miles from where we lived. And we had a property that was on about 40 acres. And, So I would hunt and fish. I mean, I was always outdoors. I had three sisters. So uh, it was just me and my dad would would come along sometimes. Most of the time he was working or, you know, uh, he did pipeline. So he was gone a lot. So I spent a lot of time in in the woods. And and, uh, it's pretty thick woods up there in in northeast Texas. You got a lot of pine and, and oak and cedar, of course, and stuff like that. But I've squirrel hunted, deer hunted, nothing really out of the ordinary really happened all those years I've spent out in the woods. And so I guess when I was probably 12, maybe 13, we moved to what I would call deep East Texas, which is Newton, Jasper area. Uh, it's, if you look at a map, it's where Texas, if you're not familiar with Texas, where uh, Texas kind of jets out a little bit into Louisiana, right along the Sabine River. You've got the Angelina and the Sabine River right there, Lake Sam Rayburn and, and Toledo Bend to the north of that area. Closest thing I would call to a rainforest, it's got its own micro environment down there. It rains in summer almost every day. It's really thick woods when you get down in that part of Texas. When we first moved there, I would take a can of spray paint and I would mark the trees when I was going into the woods so I wouldn't get turned around. And it was literally you know, that thick where you just, and there were some spots you probably couldn't even see 50 feet in front of you. And so I would wear my, my dad's welding shirts and some thick jeans. I'd have my mom, there used to be patches that you'd get for your knees. And I'd have my mom put those patches on my jeans. So I, when I walked through the stuff, I wouldn't get tore up by all the, the thorns and bushes and all that stuff going through there. It was really thick stuff. So, but I was a kid, and every day after school, I'd go out there and I'd be after squirrel hunting, duck hunting in, in the wintertime. The ducks would fly through there, and the wood ducks and stuff, and hunting acorns and stuff like that. So, I spent a lot of time in the woods. And one of my sisters had met this guy, and they started dating, and so I got to know him. And his name's Mark. And so, and they're still together now, but, you know, at the time he was probably 17, 18 years old. Like I said, I, was, I guess I was maybe 12, 13. This was around 82, 83, I think. And Mark had this old Ford truck and his pride and joy and put a lot of money into it and single cab, little old truck. And had put some brand new Pioneer speakers in there with an amp and just, uh, typical high school kid. I think I was in middle school at the time. So he was always messing with me a little bit, I guess, because I was a little brother and I was the youngest of all of us. And plus I was his, his girlfriend's his little brother. So he'd take me out and would test me and we'd go hunt and he'd leave me out there to find my way back and that sort of thing, just little pranks. And so just fun, just in fun. So one weekend, my sister had decided she was going to go to a party with some of her friends. And so Mark was like, "Uh, yeah, hey, man, you want to go play some video games or something like that? So I met him over by his house and we were going to stay at his house that night. So he, we took off, and the first thing he did was went to a little convenience store, and he was going these back roads, and he wanted to stop off the main roads. So we started off on a, what was a tar road, and then it uh, turned into a dirt road, and then he made a, uh, a ride into 
what was a old logging road. So I recognize, you know, I was familiar with logging roads. And of course, growing up in, in East Texas, you get to pretty common. So we were driving down this old logging road and going pretty slow. It, it, it had, you could tell it had been there a while. Well, saplings were already starting to grow up in, in the middle of the road. And, and so we were taking it easy, getting back up in there. So we got back there and he's got the high beams on and he cranks up his new stereo. And you really couldn't hear yourself think almost over, over the top of this thing. He's got Ben Halen blasting. So... We get back in this, the end of this logging road, and people that are not familiar with logging roads say, it's just, uh, most of them are half a mile to three quarter mile long. And typically, one side will be logged out, and the other side will be pretty thick. And so you can see pretty good ways back in there. There's a lot of new growth and stuff. And then towards the end of it, they got to turn around for the trucks, I guess, where they loaded them back in the day, and they would have a place to turn around and, and get back out. So, anyway, we stopped uh, right before we got to that area where the turnaround was, and it was just a big open area. And on my side, it was pretty thick, wood still. And on, on his side, it was more cleared out. People that have never been to East Texas or a place that's really away from the city, you don't realize how dark it is out there until you really get out there in it when the moon's not out if you get out in the woods you can't see your hand in front of your face it's just that dark where there's no light pollution at all and the stars it's just uh, amazing how dark it can get out there i never really realized it until i went back i lived in the city for a while went back there and it's just incredible so we were sitting back there and just shooting the breeze talking about girls and video games and fishing and hunting and stuff like i said he was a prankster man so he cut the music off real quick and i'm still singing and he's laughing about it we're both laughing about it and he cranks it back up and so we're just sitting there hanging out and listening to music and we hear something over the right ra- over the radio and muffled it i couldn't tell what it was it did sounded like somebody screaming and so he turned the radio down and we we're both looking at each other and not saying anything. And about that time, it was something like you would hear out of a horror movie. It was the loudest scream. Of it. You know, at that time, those slasher movies were coming out. And that's how I refer to it as a woman screaming or torn apart, however you want to say it. Man, we heard just, just a loud scream beside his truck. And about that time, something hit the truck or hit it or... I, I don't know exactly how to describe it. I throw, threw something at it. The whole truck just shuddered. Literally like somebody had dropped a 50-pound uh, log from 20 feet up into the bed of the truck is what it felt like. And there was it went from just us wondering what was going on to just sheer panic in, in, in seconds. So he put it in reverse, and we're hauling out of there we're in reverse, which trying to navigate down this little logging road in, in reverse and we, we finally hit the the dirt road and he's i mean he's fishtailing out i can tell he's he's freaked out i'm freaked out we're not saying anything we're just trying to get back to his house so we hit the the tar road finally get back to his house he jumps out of his truck man runs into his house before i can get around his truck he's in the house and he's locked the door and so i run up on his porch and i'm trying to get in I go to one of his windows and his windows were unlocked. And so I was able to open the window and crawl through the window. He wouldn't even come to the door. And so that was back in the day when people actually did leave their doors and windows unlocked. And we, before we, we'd go fish or hunt, we could put all of our stuff in the boat and not have to worry about it. So that was early 80s. So anyway, all the uh, commotion, I guess, woke his dad up and, his dad came in there, and we are both just free, not knowing what to say, man. This was just like something almost traumatizing would be a word for it. So his dad comes in there, and what was going on, what happened? So he finally calmed down enough, and he started telling his dad about what happened. And his dad had told us the story, and that night, later that night, he told us the story that he had seen something. They had some pastures behind their house. They had a few they had cattle and, and that sort of thing. He had seen something behind his house one morning, early in the morning, he said he saw something stalking some deer back there. And he said he went to get his rifle to look through the scope and get a better look at what it was. And before he could come back, he, the thing was gone. And so he said, man, you guys, you, that was probably a Bigfoot. 
And I've, I've heard of Bigfoot. When I was a kid, we used to go up into the Ozarks and around that area. And I guess Bigfoot's kind of a bigger deal up there. I knew about Bigfoot. I've never heard any vocalizations, of course, or anything like that. So I really didn't expect or didn't know what to expect. So he said, man, I'd seen something out there a few years ago. I don't think he ever told Mark about it. We stayed up the whole night. We didn't sleep. And we came out the next morning and went out to Mark's truck and it had a big dent in the side of it. Right behind the the passenger on the driver's side, when Mark was sitting, there was a big dent in the back of his truck. And it, I don't know if something threw something at his truck and it hit the truck and made the dent or if something actually hit the truck with his fist or I don't know how it got there. I just know that I'm assuming that's what caused the truck to shudder. That's his baby, I guess you'd say. And I took really good care of it. So I knew what the dent wasn't there before we went out to the woods. Um, so yeah, it was just one of those things that you have never experienced before. And I didn't see anything. I, I never saw what caused it? He doesn't want to really talk about it. He's one of those guys. I guess some people are open to telling a story. And this, this is the first time I've really told it on a public forum in, in my life. So and this you know, happened over 40 years ago. So, But, you know, I told my wife and stuff about it. And through the years, I've asked Mark. And he basically just says, yeah, I remember, remember that happened. And it scared the shit out of me. And But other than that, he really didn't want to talk about it. So, yeah, this is uh, really the first time I've shared that story. It was something that's never happened since. It did keep me out of the woods. I, when I was, the next couple of years, I would go into the woods, but I wouldn't really, I was I subconsciously, I guess, just didn't want to get in that thick stuff like I did carefree in the past. I would still go out there and squirrel hunt, but I was scared to go out there. I had friends that would go out and coon hunt at night and they would you know run dogs and, and and chase the coons and all that stuff and i just i didn't want to get out there at night again it took, I, even though i didn't really see anything i just hearing that it took me a couple two or three years to get back into the woods and mean to actually go back out there and coon hunt and deer hunt and that sort of thing back in that thick stuff and never saw anything or heard anything again that that was like that night so and of course years later i got married and i would tell my wife about it and i was hey this one time me and mark went back there in the in the woods over in where you live in east texas and we heard something and i think she i, I guess she believed me i was just one of those deals you believe or you don't and we were sitting there watching tv one night and you know, i've always been fascinated by you know foes and, and ever since then kind of bigfoot stuff and so we were listening when one night just one, bigfoot hunters or one of those shows like that it was in that same general area deep east texas right around the sabine river and they were talking to a lady that said that she had bigfoots around her house and so we were watching it and i described to my wife what it sounded like and so she said, well, she told these guys, I, yeah, I've recorded some vocalizations of what this Bigfoot sounded like. And I'd heard in other shows, the whoops and the howls, and but never, I'd never heard the same scream, never that same intensity, I guess. Uh, but when she played the recording, the hair literally stood up on my arms and the back of my neck. I looked at my wife and I said, that's what we heard. Just everything came back that night and it was, I got kind of emotional about it. It was just like, okay, well, that kind of confirmed it for me. We had heard a Bigfoot back there and on back this logging road in the middle of nowhere. And this lady apparently had heard the same thing and recorded it and that sort of thing. So it's like I said, it's been 40 years. I've been back there. And never Anything has never happened like that again. But that's what happened on a winter's night and back in 1983. That's wild. Do you know what else happened in a winter's night in 1983? I do not. I was born. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, well, now you're making me feel old, man. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, that area that you experienced that there's a lot of Bigfoot things that happen 
in that area of East Texas. There's a really good book you can pick up called, I believe it's just called Texas Bigfoot. It's by Lyle Blackburn and it does go in to detail about Bigfoot in that area, I believe. But there was a part where you were talking about how the scream you heard was really loud. Can you describe in any way like how loud it, uh, it seems like? It was like you felt it in your chest. It was the, I don't know. It was like being in the movie theater, but three, four, five times as loud as, like I said, that was when the, the slasher movie started coming out, I guess Friday the 13th and those sort of things. And, and so you would hear that audibly, but you didn't feel it physically. And this was like, if, it's I would guess maybe the thing was standing beside his window and just let out a yell. Yeah, it could have been like I said, that we never saw it. I don't know exactly where it came from. It's it felt like it came from his side of the truck and that's where the mark on the truck was or the den in the truck was on his side. So it was not only something you hear audibly, but you could feel it in your chest. It's just mm. the repercussion of it from the just the intensity of it was was something I've never heard before or since. So, like I said, the best way I could describe it is I thought if when I first heard it, it was like, is he playing a prank on me out here? Does he have one of his friends out here screaming? And, okay. But it just, it didn't make sense. And then to have the, the big dent in the struggle, I know he wouldn't have gone to that extreme to try to scare me to put a dent in the side of his truck. So after I told the story, people said, you just heard a, a black panther or something like that in the woods. And it just, all the, I guess, explanations that people gave just, didn't make sense to me because why one if you're going through the woods you got the radio on the high beams on the truck you're making a bunch of noise coming back through this on, on this logging road you're going to scare everything off it's within a mile and a half of that area you know um this thing had no truck of the noise we were making just like like i said it, it was something that we just heard over the like, like i said when we were talking back we couldn't talk back and forth over radio. you had to yell back and forth to hear yourself even or try to hear him over the radio and this thing was audible over the noise inside the cabin of the truck we could hear it from outside and then like I said, once he cut that radio off it was uh it was just uh overwhelming loud scream you said that when you heard the scream it felt like you could feel it in your chest did it affect you emotionally in any way that that you remember thinking about it? Not so much at the time of that night, yes. But like I said, I didn't, I couldn't explain what it was. We never saw it. So I just knew that it was something that wasn't normal. I'd spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours out in the woods. And I'd never heard anything like that off in the distance. I'd never heard anything like that up close. I never knew anything could make that loud of a sound out in in out in the woods and like i said it, it took me i guess it i guess on a subconscious level it did affect me like i said I, I really couldn't go back in the woods or didn't go back in the woods for a couple of years i spent more time fishing and duck hunting and stuff where it's more open where i didn't have to go back into that thick stuff and it took me a while before I got the nerve to hunt at night again. Even I used to go out and shoot rabbits. I'd go out in the field behind our house and have a shotgun, and I'd go out there and hunt rabbits at night and that sort of thing, just spotlighting them. And man, after that, uh, I would I, I still went out in the woods and I worked up the nerve to go out there at night. But I made sure that I had you know a couple of shotgun uh slugs with me in my pocket when i was out there that the six shot or whatever seven and a half to shoot the rabbits with but i made sure that i always had some slugs or some buckshot in my pocket because i guess it was back there in the back of my mind something's out there in the woods of east texas and it doesn't want you out there it's, it, like i said it only happened one time but it, it made a, an impression on me any looking into that area where you had that situation and see if anyone else has had any weird things happen in that area? No, I really didn't. It's such a, it's those are really small communities out there. So he didn't really talk about Mark, my brother-in-law now. He didn't really talk about it. Uh, like I said, his dad 
uh, had seen something. His dad really never talked about it. So I, I followed their lead, I guess. And like I said, I told my parents about it. When I got married, I told my wife about it. But as far as going back, I have been back to that area since then. I've never, I know exactly where he took us because like I said, small town. So I just never really wanted to go back to the exact spot. I don't know if he could even still get back there. Day the trees has been a pretty good while now. I'm guessing it's grown up, but I've been on other logging roads and stuff, just hunting and stuff. And, um, it, when I started going over this story in my mind, I, I really never thought about it a whole lot in the in the years recently. But it, it made sense that, that something, if predator is in the woods in East Texas, that it would be hanging out along logging roads and do that sort of if a natural ambush area. I would hunt logging roads when I was a kid. There'd be brush piles and stuff on the side of these logging roads, and a lot of times, you know, you could jump on the brush pile and the rabbit run out or one time I walked by a big brush pile and there were some some hogs in the brush pile so I could see where a logging road would be an ideal ambush spot I guess if there is something out there in in the woods for something that big to to hunt. In that same area growing up in there were there any other reports of strange things not necessarily Bigfoot related or anything else weird that would happen over the years in the same area? Well, my dad told me a story one time. He used to tournament fish on, on Raven and Salida Ben when we were living in Houston at the time. Now, I was probably three, four, five years old. He said he was coming back from a fishing tournament. Like I said, they had fished on, I guess they, I think it was Rayburn. They fished on Rayburn, and this was back in the early 70s that this happened to him. So it was him and another guy, and they teamed up, and they were following each other, pulling the boats, coming. And they were coming through uh, Conroe, which is still East Texas. It's not deep East Texas, because that area around Newton, Jasper, they call that the big thicket. So uh, it's really thick, but it thins out when you get deep out of that area a little bit. And he was coming through. He told me the story. He was coming through Conroe, and it, it had already gotten dark, and they saw something in the woods, and he said he thought the woods were on fire. So him and this other guy pulled over and they were looking at it. And he said, I thought it was just a forest fire. And so they stopped and got out and were looking at what he did, the way he described it, had been sitting there looking at it for a couple minutes and something he said, well, he said what looked like a, uh, a saucer lifted up out of the woods, got to treetop level and was gone and, a second. He, he never really told me that story before and until I shared my story with Mark. And so, yeah, he had he saw something over there close to Conroe, which is probably an hour away from the, the area where I saw or heard. We never saw anything, but we heard the vocalization of, of what I believe was probably a Bigfoot. My wife has actually seen a UFO. She was, uh, grew up in Pasadena. Heavily populated area in Pasadena. She was outside with one of her girlfriends and their kids, her girlfriend's kids. And she said she looked up and there was something that came, was coming over her house. No noise. She said the thing was huge. I tried to press her on dimensions and stuff, but I, you know she's not real good with that sort of thing. So she just described it as, as probably as as wide as a football field and a chevron shaped is what she called it and nothing no nothing happened you just watched this thing as it glided over her friend's house and then out of sight and that was the end of it she's just her friend ran inside with her kids and my wife stood out there and watched this thing fly by so uh, i've never seen anything like that i've like i said i've never heard another vocalization that was really the only thing that happened to me yeah, the whole area of East and Southeast Texas, there's some weird stuff that, that goes on for sure. The area of around Newton, where your account takes place, what do most people think that they're dealing with when they they think of Bigfoot down there, if you've been able to talk to other people about it as well? 
I really didn't. I've never. His dad was really the only one that had shared anything about Bigfoot. We lived there probably. It wasn't a long time that we lived there. Probably from the time I was. 13, 12, 13 to the time I was about 16, uh, we ended up moving. Like I said, my dad was a, a pipeline welder. Uh, so we ended up moving um, to the LaGrange area. So we moved out of that area. But we had lived in northeast Texas and, and like I said, deep east Texas from the time I was about four years old until I was probably 16. And like I said, this happened when I was I guess like I said middle school off seventh, eighth grade. So I guess I was 12, 13. So I didn't know what it was. So I didn't really know to ask or think to ask anybody, have you seen a Bigfoot or heard a Bigfoot or anything like that? Because it's so unusual that, and like I said, his dad shared his story with us that he had seen something really big and hairy and black. And, but it was early in the morning. It was the back of his, the very back of his, his farmland back there, probably I would guess 300 yards uh, away from his actual house. So he never really got a good look at it. He, I guess in his mind, that was probably what it was a Bigfoot. And that's how he described it to us was just a big, hairy black creature. I know that some people have said there are black bear in that area. Uh, I've never seen a black bear. I've never seen any scat from black bear. People always talk about, and a lot of people that I've, I've come across, of, hey, man, why you never find any bones of this thing? Why you never see any tracks of this thing? And I say to that, I say, I've really never found a lot of bones of anything out in the woods. Occasionally, I've I would come across some deer bones because there was a hunting lease that was behind my house that was probably went back about 10 or 12 miles back there. And I guess occasionally somebody would shoot one and run off and die. And so I have found deer bones. I found a couple of times I found just little small, whatever it was, I couldn't really tell, uh, just small bones, but as far as seeing anything else, I know Bobcat lived back there. There's been, like I said, people saying that Panther and that sort of thing. I, I never saw a Bobcat or a Panther either. So to not believe that something as big as a Bigfoot could live back there, I just, it doesn't make sense to me that something, if something like a, as common as uh, is a, a Bobcat, and I've never seen one in the wild out in the woods, could be back there there. Why couldn't something bigger be hiding out in, in the thicker part of the woods? And I always tell people and when they question me about it, I say, you, you don't find Bigfoot, Bigfoot finds you. And that's where I left it off. And I do tell people, people ask me where I grew up. And for the most part, it was East Texas and Deep East Texas. And I say, hey, if there is such a thing as Bigfoot, that's where he'd be. And not too long ago, one of the guys at work, I'd taken a, a customer home. I buy cars over here in San Antonio now. And one of the guys at work was had his to ride with me. And after we dropped the guy off, we, you know, BSing back and forth, you know, where we, you know, he had asked me where I lived. And, you know, I told him I lived in East Texas. And I said, man, if, if there was such a big thing as Bigfoot, you know, that's where one would live, I think. You know, he said, it's funny you say that, John. He said, I used to sell cars, you know, up in Northeast Texas. And he said, he told me a story. He said, I was coming home one night. I was driving down farm to market road. I come around a curb and my headlights hit something on the side of the road. And it was eight, nine foot tall and covered with black fur, black reddish fur. And, and I mean, it wasn't a whole lot to the story. He just said he saw it. He, he recognized what he thought it was, and I pressed him a little bit on it. And I said, well, what happened? What did it do? And I said, well, it just stood there. And I drove by it. And I said, well, how close were you? And he said, well, I was close enough to it that if it would have reached out, it could have hit my car as it was going by. So he got a pretty good look at whatever it was. And it's just it, like same kind of deal with me. And he said, the first time, last time, the first time I ever saw anything like that. And I've never seen anything like it again. It was just one night in the middle of nowhere. And it just happened. Yeah, it's a, it's one of those fascinating stories where, you know, you didn't have a, a visual, but it's just enough to jog the memory of people that listen to this and you know, I'm sure I will hear from quite a few people that are like, you know, I've seen stuff in the same area of East Texas. So I do like 
accounts like this for sure. But John, I definitely want to thank you for coming on the show, for reaching out and uh, sharing what you experienced uh, with me about 40 years ago down in deep East Texas. Well, uh, Jeremiah, I appreciate, I appreciate the time. Like I said, this is the first time I've really told the, the story and really even thought about it in, in as much depth as I had revisited it, so to speak. And in some ways, I'm, I, I guess I'm glad that I didn't see it. If I, if, if I would have seen it, I, I don't know if I ever would have gone back in the woods to, and been able to go back there and certainly not at night hunting these woods. It was like I said, it was always in the back of my mind something unusual happened to us but it wasn't until we saw that show on tv that really sank in that this was not this this probably it probably was a big foot it's just like i said it just it, it, it was just a normal night we just had gone down this old logging road and to get off the main roads he wanted to drink a few beers we we're just sitting there bullshitting going back and forth and and it just happened you know, I just, I, I can't explain any better than that. And th then that's usually how it is. There's no way to be prepared for it. Usually it just happens. And it's wild. I love talking to people about what they've seen or what they experienced, what they heard. It makes my day. So thank you so much for coming on, John. I'm sure your account will will help some listeners that are, are listening out there for sure. Uh, like I said, thank you very much, Jeremiah. I appreciate you allowing me the time to share the story and, like I said, recount it in my own mind. Just relive it, I guess you'd say. I hadn't really thought about it in, in a long time. So thank you, and I hope this helps somebody maybe that is struggling to figure out what they heard or saw or whatever. Because something something was out there. I don't, I, like I said, I never saw it, heard it, and it, it scared the crap out of us. Yes, sir. You have a great night. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Just want to take a few minutes to say thank you to you, all my listeners, for listening to the podcast. Please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on YouTube, making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications, and share the episode on YouTube with a friend. Also, if you're listening to us on a podcast... Thank you so much. Make sure that you're subscribed, share the show with a friend. Really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me at bigfootsociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's a list. If you or any relative were involved with Bigfoot sightings in the late 1970s or talk to Kevin or Clifford with the IBIC, I would love to talk to you. Please reach out and to share anything Bigfoot related from this area. If you've got anything else you'd like to share from the Mount Shasta area, I'm not going to decline that either. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going and I extremely appreciate it.